Our next speaker um, is Dr. Alim Swaredin. Alim is an AFOX fellow, um, he's a clinical investigator and a high risk obstetrician. Um, he undertook his training, medical training in Sierra Leone and is currently at the Nafield Department of Women's and Reproductive Health and the Department of Computer Science. Talk about bridging disciplinary backgrounds. Um, Alim's research focuses specifically on predicting babies at risk of adverse outcomes, uh, either in late pregnancy or during labor or after birth, and he's going to talk to us a bit about his work in that space. Um, Alim, delighted to welcome you. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank, I would first of all like to thank Focus on Research Africa for giving me this opportunity to share our experience on sickle cell disease in pregnancy. Um, my name is Alim Swaridin, obstetrician, practicing in Ghana. So over the next 12 minutes, my objective would be to highlight on the prevalence of sickle cell disease in Africa and Ghana. And i also like to highlight on the high maternal mortality associated with sickle cell disease in this the population group, and to talk about, uh, give an overview of our multidisciplinary team, um, our achievements, and our future directions. Uh, just to point out, our, the focus of our talk would be on sickle cell disease and not on individuals with sickle cell traits. So what is sickle cell disease? Uh, this is the most common hemoglobinopathy in the world which refers to the abnormal structure of your hemoglobin molecule that is responsible to carry oxygen to your tissues. It is passed down through families in an autosomal recessive manner, and it's as a result of a single point gene mutation that results in the red blood cells becoming rigid, crescent-shaped, and sticky. So when these red blood cells pass through your small blood vessels, they get stuck, prevent the blood flow, and, and prematurely break down. Clinically, this results in acute pain episodes and other complications such as chronic organ failure, acute ch uh, chest syndrome, infections, and even death. So even though sickle cell disease is recognized as a global health problem, just by looking at this, this cartogram, you can see that the burden of the disease is mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa. With over 300,000 newborns born every year with sickle cell disease, 79% of these newborns are in sub-Saharan Africa, and the country being most affected, that of Nigeria. In Ghana, we have a population of 33 million people, and close to one-third of this population carry this abnormal gene. And studies have shown that 2% of all newborns every year are born with sickle cell disease. And when you translate this 2%, that gives you 18,000 newborn babies every year with sickle cell disease. Compare that with the UK, the UK reported just 300 newborns with sickle cell disease every year. And previously, historically, it was noted that most of these babies, close to 90% of them, would not survive up to the age of five years. But with better treatments and better access to healthcare facilities, we now have more and more individuals with sickle cell disease surviving into adulthood and thus getting into your reproductive age group. At my hospital, the Kolibu Teaching Hospital, which is the largest referral center in Ghana, we see close to 1,400 individuals with sickle cell disease within this reproductive age group. And at the obstetric unit, we see 100 and 50 pregnant women with sickle cell disease. And that is just one hospital. In the UK, the last UCOS report indicated there are about 200 women, 200 pregnant women with sickle cell disease a year. And that is close to what we see in just one hospital. Now, pregnancy is emerging as a major complication in individuals with sickle cell disease. It is associated with an increased rate of both perinatal and maternal complications. For the baby, there's a high risk of growth restriction, preterm birth, low birth weight, stillbirths, and a near fourfold increased risk of perinatal death. For the mother, 
There's increased risk in both sickle cell related conditions and obstetric complications, ranging from increased hospital admissions, acute chest um, syndromes, pain episodes, pulmonary embolism, increased risk of hypertensive disorders, increased cesarean section rates, and the near 11 fold increased risk of maternal mortality. And these figures is, is encompassed in both high and low resource setting. But when you look at the low resource setting alone, the risk of maternal mortality is increased by 23 folds. Now let's put this into perspective. In the UK and most of Europe, maternal mortality deaths in women with sickle cell disease are in the single digits. In the US, it's about 23. Low middle income countries, 4,384. That is a significant risk. And when you take a look at our history at our facility, prior to 2011, at this time, pregnant women with sickle cell disease received general care at the General Obstetric Clinic. And during that time, we reported very high maternal mortality rates, close to 11,000 per 100,000 live births, which meant that almost one in every 10 uh, pregnant women that had sickle cell disease would end up in a maternal death. So in 2011 to 2014, one of my mentors decided to set up a specialized obstetrician-led sickle cell clinic that will focus on just this population group. And he used the guidelines based on the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. But during that three-year period, the case fatality rates remained the same. So in 2015, we decided to set up a multidisciplinary sickle cell obstetric team that composed of obstetricians, hematologists, anesthesiologists, pulmonologists, pediatricians, midwives, and public health nurses. And our first objective was to I tried to identify what was the main cause of death amongst these women with sickle cell disease. And from our studies, we identified that acute chest syndrome was the main factor or condition that was responsible for the death of these pregnant women with sickle cell disease. And this study was also able to highlight on the various limitations and obstacles to appropriate care amongst these women with sickle cell disease. And based on those findings, we decided to come up with a multidisciplinary care approach that we call the SCUB-1. So in this SCUB-1, we implemented the multidisciplinary care that involved joint clinics that implemented close maternal and fetal monitoring. For the babies, we performed serial growth growth scans and Doppler scans to help predict these growth restrictions and intervened appropriately. And for the mother, since the main cause of death was acute chest syndrome, we applied simple but low cost protocols to prevent and manage these episodes of acute chest syndrome. One of the key steps that we used was, was to implement latex balloons in place of incentive spirometers, because this is something most of the patients could not afford. And we also applied close monitoring of fluids and the saturations of these patients to identify when these patients were at risk of um, developing the acute chest syndrome. And all of this was done with no added cost to the patient. So we hypothesized that by implementing a multidisciplinary joint care approach in a low resource setting, we would significantly reduce the maternal and perinatal mortality rates in a before and after study design. And at the end of the observation, these activities resulted in a 62% reduction in perinatal mortality. And the near 90%, <laughs> and the near 90% reduction, I think the claps came too early, 90% reduction <laughs> in maternal mortality from 10, close to 11,000 to down to 1,172. <laughs> So this was a huge achievement that was even recognized and published by the New York Times at that time. <laughs> and, and three years onwards, we performed the sustainability assessment. And yes, we've proved that we've still been able to sustain these efforts using the same low cost approach. But for us, this was still inadequate because all of this was in a, one hospital and it's still not able to uh, bring us the desired public health impact of reducing maternal mortality in these women across the whole of Ghana and beyond. So fast forward to 2021, we embarked on the SCOP2 project, which aimed 
to implement a comprehensive and scalable strategy to increase this model of care in Ghana's 16 region and beyond. So we started by implementing a similar multidisciplinary care approach to an additional four regional hospitals across the country with oversight from Kolibu. And we provided each of these units with ultrasound machines and training to the personnel to perform fetal growth scans and Doppler scans. And we've started pediatric clinics to monitor the, the growth and health of these babies. Collectively, with all these five hospitals, we anticipate to see close to 500 pregnant women with sickle cell disease a year. And we think this is going to be the largest data set on pregnant women with sickle cell disease in the entire world. With all, we have the patients, we have the personnel, we now have the knowledge. So we believe the stage is now set to embark on further studies in the babies of pregnant women with sickle cell disease. And my vision is for us to use ultrasound data to risk stratify for adverse outcomes in these groups and hopefully develop predictive tools to help in the early detection uh, of complications and allow for prompt intervention and management. So this brings us to my focus of research collaboration in Oxford, which is on fetal neurosonography in pregnant women with sickle cell disease. As a background, fetal MRI studies, we don't have MRIs and it's not usually affordable to most of the patients. MRI studies have suggested that fetuses of mothers with sickle cell disease have a significantly smaller brain volume as compared to controls. And this is believed to be as a result of altered fetal brain oxygenation that could happen during um, um, various crises or other episodes in pregnant women with sickle cell disease. And it has also been suggested that these abnormal cortical findings result in altered neurological outcomes later in life, and such as neurodevelopmental delays. And a recent study has actually documented that babies born of mothers with sickle cell disease have a near 44% increased risk of having neuro neurodevelopmental delays. So we hypothesize that the patterns of brain maturation in fetuses in mothers with sickle cell disease are delayed compared to controls. So we plan to, to um, our study, we plan to recruit pregnant women with sickle cell disease, perform these um, fetal ultrasound scans to assess the brain from 24 weeks, every four weeks until delivery, and then using technology from the machine learning um, Omni group in Oxford, we want to assess the brain maturation and then check if there's any correlation at birth and monitor the babies up to two years to see if there's anything related with neurological um, developmental delays. Our project aims to identify modifiable in utero exposures that can affect brain maturation in these children of pregnant women with sickle cell disease. And if identified, this would allow for targeted interventions to prevent these exposures and improve the long-term outcomes of these babies. I would like to end by my talk by acknowledging my mentors, Professor Pong and Professor Dubon, and to all the members of our multidisciplinary sickle cell obstetric group uh, for the great work that they're doing on improving the lives of pregnant women with sickle cell disease. Thank you.